Okay. Right. Um, so hello everyone, welcome back. Um, so just as a sort of to ease us in, so yesterday we had a look at some of the base R functions. We then moved on to some deplier stuff. So we did things like selecting, renaming, filter, group by. We looked at some joins and then we did some conditionals like if else in case when. And then we finished with pivots. Um, today we're going to be looking at rolling functions. We've got row numbers, um, manipulating dates and strings. We're going to be looking at SPC charts and introducing functions and for loops as well. So today's session will be similar to yesterday. We'll go through the script. We'll have some more of those over to you sections. Um, and if anybody has any questions or issues throughout it, just let us know. Um, I'm here presenting all this time. We've got Zoe here as well. And hopefully Jeremy can come back and join us. I think he's having some technical issues. Um, but just drop your questions in the chat, raise your hands, whatever works for you. Um, so before we jump into today's content, I just wanted to ask if anybody had any questions from yesterday, anything that came up or that you weren't quite sure about. No? Okay, so I will just share my screen and we'll get started then. Um, all right, can people see my screen? I've lost you. <laughs> um, yes, I can see your screen. I can see your cloud. Great, thank you. Yeah, so for those of you using the Posit Cloud, I believe that you just need to log in and you'll come to a screen like this and you can just click to enter the project. Um, Okay, um, so so what do we need to do? We need to find where we were. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna control F and just search for pivots because I know that's where we ended. Oh. Okay, let's try that again. So control F, look for the word pivots, and here I am. So I could just scroll down to find where we were. So we got to this point, rolling functions. And the first part that we need to do is to install this package, the zoo package. Um, so it's also just part of setup. We will need to reload our packages, plus we need to read in the data. Fortunately, where we stopped, that's the first step to do anyway. So um, the zoo package, if you've not already got it installed, you'll need to go to the top of your script, add it to your my packages list, run that line, run the not installed, and then run the, if it's not installed, install it, and load your package into the session as well. Um, and the same if you're working on your desktop version, you'll just need to go up to the top, make sure you've got Zoom installed. Um, okay. And then just to check that you've got all the things loaded, if you run those two lines, reading in the Zoo package and reading in your data as well. And just let me know if anybody's struggling to get this loaded up. Okay, so this section is about rolling functions. So we're going to um, say we wanted a six month rolling mean of the attendances for each site in the data frame. So we've started off with our data. We then we're going to filter it just to look at three organizations. Um, we're going to arrange it so that we've got it ordered by organization code, then type, then period. And then we're going to mutate, we're going to add a role apply. So this comes from the zoom function and it's going to 
apply um, well, it's going to create a column, which is the six month row of the mean of the attendances by organization code and type. So if I just run that code, we'll have a look at it. So the first ones are NAs because you don't have six data points before those months. This is ordered by um, month. But then you get the rolling six month mean attendance. So the mean of these six attendances is 11257.5 and so on. So it just carries it on right to the bottom of your data frame. But you start off with those NAs just because there's not enough data points there. So straight and turn over to you. So um, see if you can change that window to three months instead of six. Add an additional new column with a median over three months. And with the median, see if you can calculate it on the middle time period and replace any blanks with 9999. So it's quite a big over to you first thing in the session. Um, let's give it a go. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong, wrong script. It's going to reveal the answer there. Here we go. Um, so just, I'm just going to copy this code actually and just amend it. I think that would be easier than typing it all out. Oh, I am screen sharing, I believe. Um, somebody can't see the screen. Has it opened up in another window on your um, computer, laptop? There we go. Okay, so I've just copied the code from above. I'm first gonna change the window to three months. So that's just within this row of five. I can change that to a three. Um, I then want to add a column, which is the median. So I'm gonna change this mean to median. And with the median, let's have a look at what that looks like. So within the first three, the median is the 11187, because that is the median of these three attendances. Um, see if you can calculate it on the middle time period. Oh, I should cross up that script because that's confusing me. There we go. See if we can, so I'm just gonna look at the help guide for this function. So I'm not too familiar with this one. Um, roll of five. And there's no underscore. There we go. So it's this a line argument. So it specifies whether the result should be left, right, or centered a line. And we want it in the middle time period. So we're going to change this from right to center. I'm going to have a look at what that's done. And then replace any blanks with the 9999. So this, we've got a blank here, the NA. And if you change this fill argument to 9999, that should replace that NA and any NAs in there with the 9999. So that's sort of our error code from earlier when we we're doing those case ones. So the next bit is about row numbers and date manipulation. So it's often useful to add a row number to your um, data frames. It can be useful for calculating times between things or creating an ID, for example. Um, so we're going to start off with our data frame. We're going to filter it to just to a smaller selection of organizations, a range, and then we're going to mutate and we're just going to add a row number. And what this will do is it's created this column here and it's just gone one, two, three, four, five, and so on. We did that arrange here so that we ordered it in this, um, so that we've got periods 
in the right order from like first A to second A. We've got organization codes above each other. And we've got types as well. So that's how we've done the row number, just strict row number there. Um, you can also do things like do a row number by variables in your data set. So for example, this is row number with our dot by organization code and type. So if we look at this one, we can see that it starts off with one, two and so on. If we scroll a bit further down, when it jumps to the next organization, so we've gone from RDD to RJ1, it starts row number again. So before this would be a 37, 38 and so on, but this time we're saying one, start at one for each organization and type as well. So I think when we get down to type twos, although this is the same organization, it has gone back to the number one. You can also add this row number by a date um, using this dense rank function. So we say dense rank and then we give it the date column. And if we have a look at that, it has done, so all the 1st of April are ones, the 5th, yeah, 1st of May are twos and so on like that. Um, so row number per date, in reverse order. So I think this was a question somebody asked in a previous session. Um, so normally, if you want to reverse the rank of something, you would put a minus in front of it. So for example, in this one, uh, where you're just doing organization code and type, you can do minus and it would count down. So instead of going from one, two, three, it would go from the maximum number down to one. Um, but you can't really inverse a date. There's, um, so the first date in this, was the 1st of April 2016, but the inverse of that doesn't really exist. So to do a number, a row number per date in reverse order, you have to um, reorder your data and convert the rank into an absolute value. And it looks like this, you've got multiple brackets here. And this is just a, just, just reminded me of something. What, when I'm coding, I like this thing called rainbow parentheses, which is what you can see here, like the brackets are colored in pairs. So I start with my reds on the very outside and then it's orange, green, uh, the next shade of green and then blue and so on. Um, if anybody wants to apply that setting, it's in tools, global options, um, code, display and this use rainbow parentheses. I find it quite useful when you're doing things like nesting or when we get onto functions later on, just because you're color coding those brackets. So if you ever get confused about which you're working in, that can be quite helpful. Um, but anyway, back, back to this. So this, th this is a bit messy. It's um, you do the dense rank. Um, how do you see the rows of data that you're swapping to and from the top left screen? How do I see it? Do you mean opening this data frame? Yeah, so if I, um, you can click on it up here in your environment and it'll open it up as a tab, or you could type into your console this view data row. Okay. Um, so this row number per date in reverse order, it was somebody I had asked as a question, which is why Simon's left it in here, um, in case you ever needed to do that in the future. Um, so the next bit, row number per date, jump missing rank. So um, Let's run this code and see what's happening. So min rank up here, right? So it's it's about dealing with ties. So when you're you're ranking things and two people have come first, you would usually give them first place and you would give the next person third place rather than second, for example. Um, so what's done here is it's done all the first dates as one, and then it's gone down to the next date as the next available number. You didn't follow that. Uh, the opening up the data. So when you run some code, it then in your 
environment, you can click on what it's called to open it up as a new tab so that you can see the data inside there. Does that make sense? Great, okay. Um, so back to this min rank. So we've done one for all the very first dates is then counted the number of them, there were six. So then the next rank it could give is seven for the next six dates and 13 and so on like that. Um, so now if we remove the year 2018 from that data set and just see what happens when we're using that, the row number. So this, just as a note, this exclamation mark is kind of like um, inverted. So if something is true and you put an exclamation mark in front, it becomes false. Or if you're saying between and you put an exclamation mark, you're saying not between. So this is filtering the data to certain organizations. It's then filtering the data to dates that are not between any date in 2018. Um, and then we're adding a row number by organization code and type. So if we have a look at that, and then we're gonna scroll down. So I'm just gonna see what happens when we jump from, yep, so we've excluded the data in 2018. So we're now jumping from December, 2017 to January, 2019, and it continues the rank. So it's not counting the dates, it is just explicitly just counting the number of rows. Um, but because we have ordered it by organization code and type, it does revert back to the one when we switch organization code. But similarly, when we come down to the missing 2018 data, it goes from 21 to 22. Uh, yeah, so the, the exclamation mark is pretty useful. Like you can, um, for example, we could put it in front of the organization code here and say, yeah, I think that would work. All the organization codes that are not in these ones. Yes, yes, so we've now got the HA094, but we wouldn't have the RQM. So as an over to you, see if you can adjust the code above to remove the year 2017 and return only the first three rows for only type one for each organization. So I'm gonna start just by copying that code. Some of these examples you might find it's just easier to copy the code from before because it's quite long and then just amend them. So just by changing the dates, we have done the first part. We've adjusted the code above to remove the year 2017, but to return only the first three rows for only type one for each organization, we're gonna to have to add a filter at the end. So I'm just going to run the code without the filter, just so we can see what it looks like. Um, so we've got all the data that's not 2017. We, don't, we then wanted to return only the first three rows. Um, so we want to filter it for when row number is less than or equal three. Like that. So you can also group things, your data set by dates if you're doing for type one only. Yep, well spotted. So I think you can just add type double equals and then I'm just gonna check if this is a, yeah, it's a character well factor. So you need to put it in quotes like that. There we go. 
So now we don't have type two or other or anything in there. So we can group by dates and then summarize to get totals of things. So for example, here we are grouping by year. So within our data set, we have these months, we have the first of the months, and here we want to group by year. So we use this um, floor date to get the year of that date. So if I just in the console, just do floor date of today, for example, and then I give it a period that we want to look at, we can look at year, it's returned January 2024, whereas the sys date would be 26th of June 2024. With floor date, you can also say things like floor by month to get the month. So what's happened here is we've done a group by the year of the um, date variable, year period, and then we're summarizing the uh, attendances, we're adding up the breaches, and we're calculating the median admissions. And this NARM equals true just means that if there is NAs, just to sort of ignore them for that, um, so that summary that's happening there. So if, for, um, if you leave, if you don't include NARM equals true, if there are any NAs in your um, median, your data that you're trying to do a median, it will just return NA. But this NR.RM says just sort of ignore that, it doesn't exist kind of thing. So if we run this and have a look, we see that we've got for 2016, the total number of attendances, the total breaches and median admissions. Often we're trying to look at financial years, um, which is a bit more complicated. So what you can do is you can add a column um, where you say that if the month of the date is greater than four, so if we are um, after April, add one to the year of that date, else keep the year the same. So um, if we start with today's date is the 26th of June, if we look at the month of that, it brings back the six because we're in June. So six is greater than or equal to four. So we would do the year, plus one to get the financial year. This, we are in June, but our financial year would be 24 to 25. Um, and in this point, we're just using the last of that, we're just using the 25. So, but if we were in March, this would instead just do the year, it wouldn't add the one. So if I run that, we'll see that the financial years, so we've got March is 2017, the finance year is 2017. But December uh, 2016 is 2017 as well. Um, but let me organize this by period so we can look at a better example. Uh, do, 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 do. Here we go. So March 2017 is 2017, but April 2017 is 2018. Um, financial year is a good one to write a function for. Um, yeah, that's right. It's because it's, it's the kind of thing that you're doing over and over again in your different analyses. Um, so it's good to have a function in some sort of R script that you're sourcing or in a package even that you that you bring in and use over and over again. Um, but we're going to look at functions a bit later on in this um, course. So as an over to you, see if you can create a data frame that contains a summary of sites well, these two sites, it returns the maximum number of type one attendances across those sites by financial year. It's quite wordy. Some of these examples are really wordy.
Just going to copy this financier code. Times the maximum number. Okay, so let's just check. I've created a data frame that contains sites for R4, R2, 3, um, and also just type one attendances because that's all we're interested in. We can then add a column for financial year using the code from before and summarize that we're finding the maximum number of attendances by organization and finance year. And um, this is called data year. So there we go, the maximum number of attendances for each organization by the finance, financial year. Just gonna cross those off. <clears throat> so often we have to be you might end up working with strings or character or text data. Um, so this section is just about looking to see if we can get some information from string data. So organization codes usually contain numbers and letters. And say, for example, you just wanted to pull out only the numbers from those organization codes. So in our data, our first organizations are a four, and we just want that number, we just want the four, we don't want any characters. What you can do is you can use this function parse number. Um, so it, I don't know this function, let's have a look at the help guy, parse number. Um, so you give it a, vector or a piece of data. So that's our organization code. So you then say what you want to interpret as the missing values. And it parses it so that it just returns the first number in the string. So if we run this code, we'll have a column added on the end, which is just the number in that organization code. So we've got a 913 here because it's an AD and then 913. Uh, we've got NAs for when there are no numbers. RYX has no number. Hmm. This does throw up a warning. So yeah, in the console, there is a warning message as number of organization codes do not have numbers in them. It's also a little messy, but gives an idea of what can be done. Um, yeah, so the, the parse number is expecting there to be a number in your organization codes. And when there wasn't one, like in this case of this RYX, it's thrown this error saying that you were expecting a number, but there's not one. So, but this was just to demonstrate that you can take strings and just sort of take out the bits that you don't want. So, Maybe you also want to filter your data to sort an organization codes, or um, if, you, if you're looking at other things, let's say you're looking at grocery shopping lists and you just want to like, look for something that contains the word banana or something like that. Um, you might use a filter and then the string detect. So this is um, looking for organization codes that contain anywhere in that string, a capital R or a capital P. And yep, so our organization codes, we've only got the R's or the capital P's. So we don't have, for example, this AD913 because there's no capital R and there's no capital P in there. So and over to you, um, can you find organization codes that have a number in them that's over 50? And can you return a data frame with just the organ those organization codes?
So we're going to start by using that code from earlier, the parse number, just to get the numbers on our date frame. And then we can apply a filter for where that number is greater than 50. That's not the wrong one. Here we go. And yep, we can see that all these numbers are greater than 50. Sometimes you might have a long sentence and you want to shorten it or take out certain words or characters from that. So the first, well, one way of doing this is to use this substring um, function. So you give it a vector of what you want to look at. You then give it a place to start and a place to stop. So this should return the first 15 characters in that string. Um, so this is an exam. Um, another way would be to do, so that was just counting the number of characters, which includes your like spaces and full stops and all that. Um, but another way would be to count the number of words. So this is looking from the first word and ending at the fourth word, and you're using a space to denote the, um, the symbol that separates the words. It, you could put in here a comma or something else if you wanted to. Um, and that's returned the first four words. This is an example. The difference between these, they both use start, but substring uses stop and word uses end. And if you ever forget which one you're doing, as you start typing, you get this sort of um, little pop-up, which sort of reminds you whether you're doing start and end. And if you're really confused, you can just bring up the help guide and it will tell you what you need to provide. Um, so this kind of thing can be useful for if you're looking at um, creating a graph of your hospitals or your um, ICBs and you just want the first couple of words rather than the entire name because that can overcrowd a graph. Um, so yeah, often when you're dealing with string data or text data, you'll find things like spelling mistakes, you'll find inconsistencies. For example, in one place they say um, hospital with capital H, but in another one they might say hospital with a lowercase h. Um, there might just be typos. Um, so this, this is about sort of taking that data and making it more readable for presentations and more consistent as well across your data frames. So we're just gonna start off with this long hospital name and we can see it's looking kind of funny. We've got a random capital P in the middle of hospital, for example, um, and we want to change this just to Boggins Hospital rather than Boggins University Hospital NHS Trust. So there's this package called TM. It's a text mining library and um, with some nice text features. If you've not already got this installed, you will have to go and install it. So you can go up to the top, add it to your My Packages list, and then run these bits of code again. Or you could do install.packages in your console instead. And I've already got it. So let me just jump. There we go. So within this TM package, you have this function called remove words. So we're taking this Boggins University Hospital NHS Trust, and we want to take out the words University, NHS, and Trust, just so that we've got Boggins Hospital. There we go. Um, you can see that it's got these like weird spaces going on. There's a space at the end, for example, and this kind of looks like a double space rather than a single. Um, so you can use this function called string squish to sort of like remove those spaces. It just sort of squishes everything into like a normal um, sentence sort of structure. And you can apply that to a data frame. So um, for example, you could go to your data, you could mutate with this um, remove words. So if you have a column, which is like all of your ICBs or um, trusts, so you've got lots of these hospitals with university, NHS and trust in, and you want to remove those, you can 
do that within your new tape. So as an over to you, this Boggins Hospital still has that weird capital P in the middle. And um, the question is to see if you can find a string function to fix it. So just on that, yesterday I showed the dplyr cheat sheet. There's also a stringer cheat sheet, I think. Um, it's not, yeah. Well, there, there's one that kind of looks like the, the dplyr one that I showed yesterday where it's sort of on one PDF, but there's also this um, HTML that sort of walks you through the string functions as well. So within the stringer package, there's a string to sentence, which will just convert everything into sentence case. So it will um, make the very first letter of your string a capital and all the other ones lowercase. You can also use a string to um, lower if you wanted to convert everything into lowercase. You could use a string to upper if you wanted to convert the whole sentence into uppercase. And you can use a string to title to get the sort of title version. So that's like capitalizing the first letter of the very sentence and also capitalizing, um, capitalizing all the first letters of the words except words like and and the. Either of those will work. Um, at removing that capital P. It just depends what you'd like for your final format, whether you want this hospital with a capital H or a lowercase h. Are there any questions so far before we move on to factors? Okay. So factors are a data type. Um, you, it's like character data, so string data, but it's, it's ordinal. So it's something like where you have a, a low, a medium or high setting, or you might have um, like a, a, a Likert scale. You might have strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, and strongly agree. So we're just going to load in our data again. We're applying the case when from before. So we're saying if attendance is a less than 5,000, categorize it as less than 5,000, and so on like that. Um, and let's just have a quick look at that data just to remind us what's happening here. So yeah, we've got 21,000. It's between 20,000 and 24,999. Um, so this is just to filter it down to a certain period. We're just looking at April 2016. We're only looking at type one attendances and we've arranged it by that attendance grouping. So it should be, um, we've got, was that called it? Yes, it's called data fact. There we go, data fact. So we've got all the 10,000s to 49 and then we've got 15. So this has done it by the character version. It's we haven't told it then less than 5,000 comes before 5,000 to 10,000. It's just done it on like this alphabetical evaluation, um, which we'll see when we do this super quick plot and GG plot. So normally when you're looking at something like this, you would prefer this to be in the order of that factor. You would like the less than 5,000 to be on one end and you'd want to go up to the 25,000 and over on the other end. Or you might want other orders for different graphs, but um, that's what we prefer here. So the reason it's done this is because the, um, the attendance grouping variable is a character. If we convert it into a factor, we can specify the levels or the order that that should go into. So that's what we're doing here. We're saying take attendance grouping, 
make it into a factor with these levels and we've specified the order. We want less than 5,000 first, and we want 25,000 and over and last, and we want the others in a sequential order. So if we run this and we run our plot again, you can see it's now ordered that graph into the way that we set up our levels. If for some reason we wanted um, less than 5,000 at the very end, we could do that. We could just move that there, for example, and then run the plot again, and it will have moved it to the very end. Um, so I'm just going to undo that bit for the next part. So we're going back to this less than 5,000 on the left and 25,000 on the right. Um, and if we look at our data frame, we can now sort it. This is called data back, yeah. We can sort it by this column so that we've got all our less than 5,000s at the beginning. So this can be really useful to show groupings of providers by systems, for example. Um, you can reorder factors based on a different variable. So say you wanted to show your providers by number of attendances or highest performance. Um, there are other funky things with factors that you can do, but we're not going to cover that in this sort of introduction, well, intermediate course. Um, but it's just to say that you can reorder your factors and build your factors based on other variables or other things going on in your script. Um, but as a warning, if you set your data as factors, I will not like you adding data into that column unless it is one of the factors that you've created. So there are ways of getting around that, but um, we're not going to go into detail on that right now. Um, it's also possible to make factors more dynamically. Again, no time. Uh, I am going to add something as well. That I, can, I can understand that factors is very complicated. And one of the things that will cause a lot of issues when you have NA, none as a factor as well. Usually what happens in our default is that they always put NA as the last. And no matter how hard you try, NA will always be the last in default. And it gives you a lot of problems when you plot in the graphs because your NA will either be the first first one or the last one. So uh, maybe I will just post a link of the blog post that may help you solve this problem when you have NAs as part of your factors and how could you rearrange them accordingly to how you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's also other things you can do within the factor function. So um, I'm not sure what this exclude NA I think that just ignores the NAs in your data. I don't think that gets around what you've done, uh, what you're talking about, Jeremy. But what I have done in the past is use this, um, the difference between levels and labels. Um, so you can call your NAs something that will be at the bottom. You can replace it with a character. And then you can, so it's ordered by that level, but then you can give it a label which says missing data, for example. So we're going to do an introduction to dynamic text. So this is where you want to um, say you've got an automated quarto or R markdown report, and you want each time you run it for it, the number of attendances to reflect the latest number of attendances. So um, this is just a way of combining your text and variables, and it's useful for writing commentary or dynamic labels in your um, paragraphs of text. So say you wanted to create a sentence that says the maximum number of attendants was the maximum number of attendances that are in your data set. You can use this function called paste and it sort of joins your bits of data together. So just a quick note, here it is um, using paste zero. And what that does is it pastes the, well, I'll show you first um, text, if I run text. Mm. So it says the maximum number of attendances was 32,209 because it's done the maximum number of attendances, which we supplied, and there's this data, the maximum of that. 
we've got a space in this sentence and paste zero says put these two things together like jam side by side but if I was to remove that zero and just use a strict paste it will not put that space it'll do a double space because the default in paste is to put a space between the things that you're pasting together but you can say other things like set to do that with a comma and it's pasted them together with a comma between the things so it was just a flag that sometimes you might see a paste, sometimes you might see a paste zero, and they are almost the same. It's just a paste zero is um, assuming that you already have your separators included in what you want to paste together. That maybe was a bit confusing. <laughs> it's something just to be aware of when you're playing around with it in the future, whether you want spaces in between your bits that you're putting together, or you want commas or colons and so on. Um, but with the paste function, you can just keep adding more and more to the sentence. So here we're putting in the maximum number of attendances was, and then we're telling R to go and bring the maximum number and the lowest number was, and we're again saying, go find the minimum number. And if I wanted to add some more, I can just add more text. So yeah, I didn't put a space at the end there. And that's why it's put the one and the add straight to each other. Um, but to correct that, we just need to add a space in there because I'm using paste zero. A way around paste um, is using this glue package, which um, just makes things a bit easier to read. So with this paste, you can see that if you've got a whole paragraph or lots of these together, it's quite difficult to read and you have to keep adding all these bits in and doing all your commas and making sure you've got those spaces where you need them. But um, if you use this glue, well, the glue function from the glue package, it sort of does it in a neater way. Um, so if you've not already got glue installed, you will have to, or you're using the posit cloud, go back up, add it to your packages list, and run these bits of code just to install it. So once you've got glue loaded into your session, you can create variables in your environment. So the maximum number of attendances, um, 32209, the minimum number of attendances, and then you just say glue, and then you say the maximum number of attendances was, and within these curly brackets, you put in the variable, and the lowest was in curly brackets, minimum attendance. So with the paste, um, you had you separated this out, so you put in the different like parts of the sentence. You put in a string, and then you did a comma, and then you gave it the variable to pull in, and then you did the comma, the string, comma, variable, comma, string, and so on like that. But with glue, it's all in one sentence. You just put the bits that R has to get from somewhere else in these curly brackets, and it's just a bit nicer to read. Like I can see straight away that this is just one sentence. I might because I know what I'm looking at, I know that the bits in the curly brackets are the bits that are evaluated and will change in the future, whereas the text is set and it will always say those things. But if I'm looking at the paste, it's just a bit, a bit of an eyesore to me, and it's just harder to read and see what's going on. But if you're using glue, you will have to load in the glue package, and maybe you don't want that dependency. There, it just depends what you're trying to do in your script. I think I have a question before we go to the next topic. Right. Take a look at the chat. Um, is it better to use factor or as dot factor? So just going to have a quick look at these functions. So as dot factor is in base R. Um, maybe factor is a block question mark. 
uh, factors also baseline. So factor, you can do levels and labels. Oh, no, wrong one. Oh. Not sure what the difference is. So if I did as, uh, yeah? In, okay, maybe I can try to explain it. Like, okay, so the S dot factor is actually a, let's say like a wrapper of the factor with limited arguments. Mm -hmm. So it, people usually use S dot factor to blindly turn all your columns to factors without considering levels, your orders. So it is actually like a faster option. Okay. However, uh, if you're very particular about what the levels you want for your columns, like you want the first, second, third of a particular situation column, then factors will be a better option. So sometimes uh, what I would do is I will use S dot factor to turn whatever columns I want quickly first, because if your columns are already factors, your function will actually skip them and will not have to relook them just to rearrange the orders. And then for the columns that I need a specific order, I will rechange the columns to the factor again to label my level specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So this as dot factor, if I give it the a vector low, medium, high, it does create a factor, but it doesn't order the vector, the levels. It's just done this sort of default ordering of them. I think probably alphabetically. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Factor, you can then within that specify what your levels are and say that you want it so that low is the first level, medium, and then high. Yeah. Yes, yes. So this is, so as dot factor will just do it alphabetically. So it will create your factor data, but it won't apply the levels. You can't do things like um, applying labels as well, which can be useful. Um, but the factor has more arguments, more things you can do to make it nicer in the long run, or if you have a strict ordering that's not alphabetical. Yeah, so like it's, like if you want with your functions to run fast on many columns, do it blindly. You do an S dot factor first, and then for columns that you know you have a very specific order that you need to do, then you can you can do these specific columns and do your factor function. So yeah. it's more of a yeah, when to use it rather than which is better and which is not. Okay, and then let's see. okay, and I would like to talk more about the glue function before I go to the next topic yeah. is that usually one of the problems that I face is that when the numbers get really large for integer like glue will represent the numbers in scientific notations and I was wondering or curious of how you guys like counter this issue um there are other functions, so I forget what they are. I always have to Google them every single time. But um, mm. there are ways of converting your numbers. Like I think it's pretty num, maybe. Maybe, yeah. It's used for prettifying your numbers, so you can specify things like to avoid scientific notation or to use a certain. Um, uh, okay. Um, but there, there are also other ones that I've used before. But every, every single time it comes up, I have to like, you know, go to Google and check which one it is. I see. I see. Because sometimes, like recently, there was this new function that like the news R package was presented in the Posit conference last year. Was the mm -hmm. epops e package that's meant to solve the this problem in the presentation. 
Uh, maybe I will just post the link of the package, I think, EPOPC. And I'm not sure if I can find the YouTube video of the EPOPC presentation, the our deposit conference last year. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So maybe I will just uh, copy link address here. And maybe another library that may be useful is uh, for the more challenging uh, glue uh, reports is Verbalized Art by Kara Thompson. Mm. Uh, let's place the link here. Because sometimes when we have to give reports like zero patients with an S, one patient without an S, two or more patients with an S, and it gets very annoying to read these kind of grammatically correct reports and pluralizations. So uh, Kara Thompson's verbalized R can help to resolve these plural problems and to help you also uh, express certain things like how you put, put like A, B, and C and that kind of things and to make the date formats nice as well. It's something that you might want to check it out. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or other useful information? Okay, um, so the next bit is on statistical process control graphs. Um, just wondering how many of you have come across SPC before? Maybe if you could just raise your hand. Okay, so some of you, some of you not. That's fine. So um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about why SPC charts are here. Um, there is the, the NHSR plot the dots package does some explanation and um, walking you through the charts there. And there's lots of um, guidance in the uh, making data count program with the NHS, but um, roughly what an SPC chart, oh thank you Zoe, um, <laughs> what an SPC chart is doing is it's um, sort of plotting your data as points, it's connecting a line through those points and looking at the variation that's going on to understand if um, the differences between your points is maybe just like a sort of a usual or a typical variation um, or whether the variation is something unusual uh, I forget the exact terminology they use within the making data program. Um, but so uh, as an example, um, I was talking to someone about, uh, I was trying to introduce them to the concept of SPC charts. And I started off explaining it quite technically and they were, they were getting a bit confused. But then they, they asked me if this was similar to their diabetes um, app that they have, which is monitoring their blood sugar levels. So they're taking blood sugar tests throughout the day and it's, they, it comes up with this graph and along your x-axis you've got the time or the date and your y-axis you're, you're plotting the blood sugar. And on this graph it's got lines for what your typical blood sugar would be. And so they know that if the dot, they know that the dot changes, that the amount of blood sugar they have changes throughout the day, but they know that if it's within these certain lines that it's not anything to worry about. It's kind of normal that the dot has gone up and down, but it's still within these lines, so it's okay. But if it goes out with those lines, they're like, oh, this is not a normal variation. I need to do something about that. So um, it will become a bit more clear as we start to bring up the charts on the screen, and we can go over it again then. But that's, it's just about looking at the type of variation you have in your data and understanding whether that variation is typical or not. So to start off with, we're going to need to load in the NHSR plot the dots package for this. So if you've not already got this installed, you'll need to add it to your packages list at the top. I think it's all capitals. 
That doesn't look right. Just capitals and HSR, and then the rest is lowercase. And then run this code again. Okay, so once you've got that loaded in, well, installed and loaded in, we're just going to take our data, we're just going to look at one organization code and just type one attendances for now. Um, I'm just going to close these extra tabs and just have a look at that data frame. So only looking at RER, we're only looking at type one attendances, but we can see if we order this by year, um, in April it's about 11,000, in March 12,000, so the numbers are going up and down. And we just pipe this straight into one of the functions from the plot the dots package is PTD SPC. So we're saying that the value field, what we are interested in is the number of attendances and our date field is the period column. So if I run that, um, you have this graph. So what it's done is it's put the dates along the bottom, it's plotted the number of attendances and it's put the line through the points as well. These dashed lines are sort of what it's calculated as the boundaries of normal variation. So it's saying that points within these dashed lines are okay, we don't have to worry about them. It's concern, that's it, it's variation uh, is common or, I'm, I'm getting myself a bit confused, getting a bit ahead here, it's, it's different terminologies, but it's about the variation between your points. So this, because all your points are falling, thank you, common cause variation, because your points are falling between these dashed lines, there's no cause for concern. The variation is common, it's normal, it's typical. Um, if your points were out with these lines, then the variation might be a cause for concern. It's special cause. Um, there might be something happening. Maybe, um, maybe COVID happened and your attendance is plummeted, for example. Um, we don't have this problem here because the data is only to 2019. So, yeah. But within this SPC chart, um, what's going on in the background is it's doing all the mathematical calculations. It's calculating these boundary points. It's calculating whether the um, variation is common or special. And it's, it's also looking for things like um, whether you've got the consecutive runs. So if everything's suddenly increasing, for example, if you've got, I think it's seven or it might be six points in a, as an increase, it will flag that up. Yes, Jeremy? Yeah, for the boundary point, I was wondering, is it determined by the data set that you have or is it something that users have to input them or it's actually both, it's quite flexible? I mean, how is this boundary points determined? Um, it is calculated from the data in this data frame and um, the data SBC. It's, um, I think it's, it's a sigma above the mean. Um, so it's, it's doing all that maths in the background so that you don't have to do it. All we've done is supplied the data frame itself. We've just given it this raw number of attendances. It's then calculated the mean, it's calculated the sigmas, um, the variation, it's done all of that for you, um, just so that you can get this graph at the end and see whether it's common or special, special cause. Um, I think, I don't think there are ways of setting the um, these bars, the, the dashed lines in this function, but if you wanted to create your own, you, you, could, you could look at the source code and amend it. It's, it's all open source. It's, um, I think, I don't know if the Git has been put in the chat. Um, let's see if we can find it, but you can, so, I've, while you're looking for that, Anya, just to say that there was a workshop from um, Jacob Anhoy, who has he's the creator of QI Charts 2, which is a similar package. NHSR plot the dots is based on the NHS England choice of the points and the color schemes, where QR Charts 2 has the same statistics, but the points change when it's like I think it's eight points or nine points, and 
Jacob's also written something for his own charts on something called run charts. He's a clinician in Denmark and has done a lot of statistical things. So if you're really in interested in the statistics, the uh, video that he did was very good and it was about base R. So what we've done with plot, NHSR Plot the Dots is to take the making data count decisions about just the points and the colors, nothing really else than that, and putting it into, and also the logos, so they're generated automatically for reports in the NHS. But the st statistics that are underlying it are what we've based it on. So the code is available and also um, QI charts too, which I would also say is an excellent package because mm -hmm. SPCs are quite wide ranging. So you can do things like unintended consequences, rare events, uh, percentages. It, you can get really into it with statistics. And that's a really comprehensive package, whereas ours is not simple, as it were, NHSR community, but it's very specific to the NHS and it's one type of um, SPC chart. There is another one as well for funnel plots, which I've also mentioned. That's also in NHSR community's website uh, repository. And so that's possibly more familiar to people in public health. So it is a type of SPC chart. I will stop talking because I could be excited <laughs> about SPCs. Yes. Is... <laughs> no, me too. <laughs> I'm uh, excitement. <laughs> yes. Uh, for those of you who knew about SPC, you might have seen the Making Data Count Excel SPC generation tool, um, where you put in the data and it does this for you. This this will should produce the same plots as that Excel tool. Um, but yeah, this is the the GitHub um, <clears throat> repo for the the package. If you wanted to explore the code or um, it. I think there's a vignette and it'll like walk you through what's happening as well. Um, but back to this training. So the so we've plotted an SPC chart of just the attendance, type one attendances for RDR. And um, it's an over to you. We want to see if you can add a target, um, what the target number of attendances should be aligned to that, and also to show if the improvement is a reduction. So usually we'd to have a lower number of attendances over time. Um, so just as a, as a hint for this one, I do recommend doing question mark ETD SPC, just to bring up the help guide to help you with this. So to add a target to your SPC chart, you can just use the target and supply any number you like. So in this case, we're saying the target number of attendances is 17,500. And what it's done is it's plotted a line for that target and it's sort of evaluated where you're at, where your points are and where your variation is in response, like in relation to that target. You can also add an improvement direction. And that could be a decrease or an increase. So what we're saying here is if the number of attendances are coming down, that's good. And so in the background, it's evaluating that and saying, if it's good, then let the user know it's good, it's all happening. Um, or if it's not, good you know if the points aren't decreasing they're actually increasing it's going to flag that up as like this is something you should be um this is a warning just be aware that this is happening so so far this is just a SBC for type one attendances but say you are also interested in the other types of attendances um what you can use is this facet field argument and for those of you that are familiar with ggplot, this is similar to facet wrap, 
in that you're going to end up with plots side by side by a certain uh, variable. So we're just saying facet field by type. And here we've got now an SPC for type one, type two, and others. Um, and what we see here is we've got these gray Cs. Um, this is just, you know, common variation, common pause is not, not anything to worry about. But for other attendances, we've now got these blue and these yellow points and this um, H symbol. So these are saying that there's special cause of concern when it's yellow and special cause improvement when it's blue. So for other attendances, in towards the end of 2019, well, 2018 and 2019, we're seeing greater numbers of other attendances. And this is concerning. This is beyond the normal fluctuations, variation in your data set. Um, so that was just with this facet field argument, but it does kind of, it's kind of hard to read. Like you've got these like really squished, like we can't see what's happening with type two here. It's, it's basically just all down at the bottom. And that's just because the number of type two attendances is so much lower than the number of type one attendances. So what you can do um, is just tweak it a little bit. So here we've got, we're adding our improvement direction as a decrease. And we're going to then feed that into um, this other function from the package, which sort of uses the ggplot underneath it. So we're saying things like, make sure your y-axis varies between your graphs. So fixed y-axis multiple, if you set that to true, you get this graph. All our, you're saying all the graphs have the same y-axis, which is why you end up with this hard to see what's going on with the type 2. But if you set it to false, it's going to allow different y-axes for each of your graphs. Um, so I'll just run that. And you can now see what, what's actually happening with type 2. So before, it just looked like a straight line. But here we can actually see there are ups and downs. Um, you can also specify things like how you want the dates formatted. So in the previous chart, it was just the 01 slash 04 slash 016. And it's kind of hard to read because you put all these sequential points there and it's all sort of jammed together, squished together. But what you can do is you can say things like, I just want the month, the B, and the year. And I want the axis to be broken two months rather than one month. So now we've got APR 1.6 and then it goes June 1.6. It's just a bit easier to read. Um, so as an over to you, See if you can create a fasted plot for type one attendances for these three organizations. Change the point size, uh, point size to look a bit nicer. Um, change the x-axis label to date rather than period. And just make any other changes that you want to to this graph. Maybe you want to add a title, for example.
So to do this, we first will need to filter data so that we are only looking at these three organizations and type one attendances. We can then create a basic SPC um, like this. I'm just gonna save it as an object. And then we can pipe into this um, GT plot and make some nice changes. So the question were to make the point size a bit nicer. So I've set my point size to two here. Um, I've added a title, I've changed the X axis label to date, I've put the icons on the top left instead of the top right, yep, um, and I've changed the size of the icons as well. So if we just have a look at this PTD create ggplot. There are lots of different options that you can do, lots of ways you can manipulate this graph to make it look the way that you want. So it's already set up to use the um, NHS making the data, make, make data count, making data count program. Um, it's set up to use those colors, this sort of orangey yellow and the blue, but you can specify other ways to make it fit the formats of your other graphs, for example. Like if you if you use the word date or if you use the word month in some other charts, you might want this to be consistent with that. So this is just to show that it's quite flexible what you can do with this SPC chart. It's got a lot of different ways of modifying things. Um, so I think we're gonna pause here for a break just for before we move on, but are there any questions about what we've covered so far? Don't know if people are typing or if, <laughs> if, if everything's been fine so far. Yeah, I, I can paste this code into the chat. Um, Okay, well, um, shall we meet back at uh, five minutes past 11 for the, for the next part functions? So, oh, sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> um, okay, what I was just saying is that we're gonna look at functions now and um, functions are useful for when you want to do something over and over again, but you don't want to have to keep copying and pasting that code from before. Um, it's also quite useful because if you find that your function maybe has a bug in it or it's not working quite as expected or you want to add a new feature, you can just go back to the original function code, change it there, and then that change will have applied across every single time you've used that function. You don't have to uh, search through all your scripts for any time you've used something like that. You just know that the update will have applied across any time you've used it. So we're going to start off really simple and then we'll, we'll build up. So we're just going to set some variables. We're going to, in our environment, just do an X, a Y, and a Z, set at 5, 10, and 50. And we want to triple each of these variables. So you could do that in longhand. You could say x times three, and then you could do the same y times three and z times three. But you have to keep doing that every single time. So say you then had a new variable in the future, you have a w and that's four, and you want to times that by three, you then have to go type that in w times three. Instead, you can build a function that just takes any number you've given it and times it by three. So you start off with naming your function. So naming functions, you want to make it something that you understand, but is also short and you can easily type it. It's coder friendly. Um, so it's best with functions to start it with a verb because a function is doing something. So you use a doing word. So in this case, we've gone for times three because our function times is, times is a number by three. 
Um, you might also have something like um, your function might be get maximum attendances, or it could be plot SPC. So each of those started with a verb, it said times, it said get, it said plot, so we know we're doing something. And then it was followed up with what it kind of does, so that we know when we see in the future, when something's written times three, we go, oh yeah, that's the function that times these things by three. Um, but you also don't want to make your function name really, really long. <laughs> so it's a bit of a balance, but my advice would be to start with a verb so that you know it's a doing something. Um, so yeah, we've started here, we've named our function times three. We then say it's a function. We, in these round brackets, we say what the arguments, the parameters, what we're putting into the function is. And in here, we're putting in an input. And then between these curly brackets, we say what we want the function to do. Um, so we want the function to return, to give us input, what we've given it, times three. So a function is kind of like, like a black box. You put something in, you get something out. And what we're saying is we're putting in input. The black box is this return input times three. And what we get is the output. So if we run this function, and then we can say times three x. So we've given it x and it's returned 15 because x was five. We can then do times three of y, and we can also give it a number that we haven't set before. We could say seven, we could say 17, we could do anything in there, any number, and it will times it by three. A function can only return one object. Um, there is a sort of way of getting around that. I, I think we cover it later on, but if not, I'll come back to it. Um, so just be aware that you could do lots of things in those curly brackets, but it's only going to return one. And by default, it's only going to return the last thing you do in that function. Um, but you can use this return command to specify what you want it to return. So that's going to make it clear as we start running through this. Um, so here we're creating a new function called x times y. We give it two variables, x and y. And then within that, it's going to calculate a result, which is x times y. It's going to say b is 150, and we want it to return. The answer is the result, and b is b. We've used paste zero, but we know from before that we could replace this with a glue in the future if we wanted to. So I'm just going to run this function um, so that we could see what happens. Um, so this is how we run the function. We're giving it the x and y from before, from the environment. We're setting it to a variable called var. So var is, the answer is 50 and b is 150. So what it's done is it took the x, which was five. It took the y, which is 10. It's calculated result as 150, uh, as 50. It's calculated b as 150, and then it's pasted that out so the function has only returned one thing. It's only returned what we told it to, this line here. The answer is result and b is b. It hasn't told it, it hasn't printed out b or result separately. Um, so you don't have to specify what it returns because by default it will return the last thing. So if I remove this return, for example, it's going to be the same. The answer is 50 and b is 150. Um, but if we instead said return B, it should return B instead of that. Var is B. It's not the answer is 50 and B is 50. It's B because we've told it to return B. Um, so as like a general rule, even if your function only does one thing in it, just use return, it makes things a lot easier in the long run because you can add things into your function um, later on and you might forget what it's returning. So um, even in this one, we've done a return, even though it's only doing one thing, um, you don't have to, but it's just better practice. Oh, there's an example here. So this is the X times Y with no return in it. Um, yeah. So 
scope is something that I very briefly glossed over yesterday when we looked at if statements, um, because it's easier to explain in the context of functions. So these curly brackets um, and scope. So a, what happens in a function scope is not in the global environment. So if we look on this right-hand side in the environment, although we've run this function, there is nothing in there called result. But in the function, there is. We're, we're creating a variable here. We've assigned a variable called result, but it doesn't exist in the environment. That's because it only exists within the scope. So a function scope does not appear in your global environment. It exists sort of within the function only. Um, so to demonstrate that, we're going to set in our environment a variable called test, which is monkey. We can then create a function um, which takes two numbers, it times them together, it says test to move, and it prints the answer is then test. So what are we expecting to see from this? So we know that in our environment, test is monkey, but in our function, we're setting it to move. So what are we expecting? Are we expecting this to say the answer is monkey or the answer is move? So if we run it, it says the answer is move. But in our environment, test is still monkey. So this is because it's within the scope. So within the scope of the function, we've set test as move, but in that doesn't change the environment. It's just what's it happening within that function. In the environment, test is still monkey. So within a function, you can, you can put lots of code in there. You can just keep adding multiple steps into your function. So here we have x times y plus 10 date. So this is a function that takes two variables. It calculates a result, which is x times y. It calculates the day of the month, which if I just run that day, which is day, you'll see it says 26. It then says if else, so if the day of the month is greater than 15, add 10 to the result. If it's less than or equal to 15, do just the result. So if we run that, um, yeah, so without running the actual call of the function, maybe just type into the chat what you expect this, this to give. What, what, what's the output of this function if we give it the numbers three and 10? Okay, a couple of you responded, 40. Okay, so I'm going to run it now. And it does, it does return 40 because we're doing three times 10. We're saying day of month is 26. 26 is greater than 15. So we do three times 10 plus 10. So functions can get pretty convoluted quickly. It can be hard to read. And often when you're writing functions, you're writing them on, you know, like today, but I might in two months time, look at this function and go, what did that do? Why, why do I have this? Um, so what you can add is this thing called a doc string. And that's just a way of sort of documenting what's happening in your function in a consistent way so that when you pick it up in the future, you can immediately see, oh yes, this function does that. It has these inputs, it gives me that, and here's a little example to run it. So here is a doc string that's been written out. So we've got our x times y plus 10 date, this function, it takes x and y, we've got a bunch of comments, and then we've got what the function does. 
But what the comments are saying is it gives a verbal, uh, like some sentences explaining what the function does. So it takes two numbers, it adds 10 to the result, if the current day of the month is greater than 15. Otherwise, it returns the product of X and Y. It tells you what the inputs are, what the parameters are. So we've got X, which is a numeric data. It's a number. It's not a character. It's not a date. It is just a number. And we've got Y. Um, <clears throat> It tells you what is returned, what the output of the function is. The output is the product of X and Y with 10 added if the current day is past 15. And we've got a couple of examples here that you could just lift up and you know, paste into your console and see what's happening. Um, so that's quite a long doc string for this quite small function that you, you might think is quite easy to understand and read what's going on. But it's just to demonstrate that like, even um, when, you, when you've got hundreds of these functions lying around in your various bits of code or in your package or whatever, having something like this in a consistent way across all your functions makes it really easy to find out what's going on. You expect that there's going to be some sort of summary at the top. You know that there's going to be examples at the bottom. You know you can quickly see what your inputs and what your outputs are. Um, it can be quite lengthy to write, and you might not want to do this for every single function, or you might not want to do it for the really simple ones, but it's good practice too. And you might find in the future thanking yourself for having done it. Or you might find if you share in code with others that they are thankful that you've done it because they might not understand what you've done. They might be um, beginners, for example, and you just don't know any of these symbols and what's happening. Um, there's also, I'm just gonna, um, so this was written out manually with um, just the hashtag, the comments, and then just writing all these paragraphs. But another thing you can do is if you click with inside your function, you can go to code, and then you can go to insert Roxygen skeleton. And that'll have, it'll, it does this hashtag with an apostrophe. This is because it's coming from package development. When you're creating your own packages, it needs this sort of, um, other structure so that it can then format that into a help guide later on. Um, that, that might be something you want to look at in the future. But it's you can see it's already populated the, the parameter, it's populated the examples, and so you don't have to keep typing this out or remembering what to type out if you want to. Or you can just type it out, or you can create your own structure. Maybe you'd rather have the examples at the top or the inputs listed in a different way. It's, it's entirely up to you. I would just advise making it consistent across all your functions. Yeah, so as Simon said here, this is an extreme example. That's a lot of text for quite this small function. And, but at the basic level, you should include a um, description and a variable description because people will use it. You will use it in the future. Um, so how do you do, a, there's a question, how do you do a function for a simple percentage calculation? Um, so you could percentage, oh no, I should start it with a verb, calculate percentage. And so this is a function. I like to come back to my inputs. I, that's just the way I think. So what we're going to give it, we're going to give it, uh, we're going to say this is a percentage. Of, so we're going to need two numbers. We're going to have a numerator and a denominator. And we're going to say percentage is numerator divided by denominator times 100 return percentage. Let's see if that works. So if I do calculate percentage and then give it the number two and three, it's 66. This is numeric, but if you wanted it as a cart, for example, we could have paste first, Percentage. We could also do some rounding. Um, oh, nope. 
uh, and then remember what I'm returning. Something like that. And then because I've got this space, I should remember to use paste zero. Or I could use glue. So we've got an over to you. So I'm just gonna move this just so it's out of that section and just pull it at the bottom. Um, so it asks you to tweak the above function. So this one, you can either use the one with the big doc string or the one above it. Um, move that. Um, so we're using this x times y plus 10 date function. Um, so instead of it timesing the first two inputs and adding 10 to the result based on the day, it adds a number that you specify. So instead of adding 10, add a number that the user can provide. So if I want it to be seven, but Jeremy wants it to be three, um, for example. And for bonus points, assign your result to a variable. I'm just gonna bring that function down so we can see it. <clears throat> so what you can do is you can add another argument to this function, something to be added. So I've just put an add here and where it was 10 before I've said add and then to assign to a variable, I say variable and then use the arrow symbol and then I can put any number I like in here. So I've used 15 for now. We'll see what that, whoop, have it run the function. Remember to run the function. There we go. Um, there we go. And that's brought back 19 because we've done four times one plus 15. But now we can change that. So in the future, I might want this to be 26. And there we go, it's changed it. <clears throat> So um, you can create these functions, you can use them just as they are, but you can also apply them into your data frame. So just as an example, um, here we've got, we're taking our data frame, we're just looking at a couple of organizations and type one attendances, and we're excluding the breaches column. We've got that minus here, but you could use an exclamation mark instead if you wanted to. So let's just have a look at our data set. So we've got type one attendances, we've only got three organization codes and the breaches column is missing now. So we are applying it row wise. Um, so we create a new column, we've named it attend times admit maybe plus 10, <laughs> which is a long column name, but it tells you what is happening. And we're saying apply that function that we've just created using the column attendances as our X, admissions as our Y, and our add as 10. So now when we look at data fun, we have, uh, I'm gonna assume that this is 17,000 times 3,000 plus 10. I'm not gonna do the maths myself, but I'm gonna assume that's right. 
Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it's a silly example. You're probably never gonna actually need to do attendances times admissions plus 10, but it's just to demonstrate that you can create these functions. You could use this calculate percentage function, for example, and apply that in your data frame. Um, so we've got an over to you and um, you're asked to, um, oh yeah. question if you don't mind, like sometimes you have to create functions that is not meant to return anything. For example, functions to create PDF files mm. and back our function to create Excel files and we're not supposed to return anything. Is there a way to tell the function that it's not returning anything? Because by default, you'll return the last value mm. of your code. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious to find out. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but what I would suggest in a situation like that would be to have something in your function that checks if the PDF was actually returned and then to, uh, or created, and then to return a statement that says PDF was created. It is saved as, you know, PDF underscore 26th of June, for example. Okay. Um, so the over to you is to see if you can calculate a function well, create a, fu a function to calculate the mean. So there is a function that already calculates the mean, but you're not allowed to use that. This is just to get you to try and think of what's going on in a function. Um, and for extra credit, to see if you can create a function that calculates the mean of any number of uh, numbers. So the first one, see if you can create a function that takes three numbers and returns the mean of just those three numbers. And the second one, create a function that calculates the mean of 50 numbers or 26 numbers. You don't know how many numbers you're going to get. And without using the inbuilt mean function, that's the important part here. Okay, I'll give a couple more minutes for this. If anybody's done it, do let us know in the chat.
So there's a question about the calculate percentage function. So um, the two and the three are just the numbers I've put in to the function. Okay, so we're going to start off with this mean of three numbers. So to calculate a mean, we need to do the sum of the three numbers and then divide it by three. So sum, oh, we need to, we need to give it three numbers first of all. So I'm just going to call them X, Y, and Z, but you could call them anything you like, A, B, C, number one, number two, number three. And then you can sum. And then you can say that the mean is the sum divided by three. Return the mean. Let's see if that's worked. Uh, let's give it the numbers three, seven, six. Mean is 5.3. If we change some of those numbers, give it three fives, the mean is five. So that's how you could do it for just three numbers. But has anybody worked out how they could do it for any number of numbers? Or can anybody see it now that they know how to do it for three numbers? Using a list, possibly. Do you have some code that does it? Oh. So I'm just going to paste that into R here. Some unlist X length X. Let's see if it works. So, so what would X be? It would be a vector. Or, well, list. Yeah. That works, yeah. Um, so what, what we've got is that you give it an X, that you, it's similar, but instead of a list, we're just using vector um, manipulation. So there's a function called length. And what that does is it returns the number of um, points in your vector, number of data, don't know, I forget what the number of scalars in your vector. So the mean is summed by, by no. So here we're saying, uh, just use the same one. So we're giving it this vector, three, four, five, and we're saying sum across that vector. The length of that is three. There are three numbers in this vector. And then you can do the mean of that, just dividing one by the other. And because it can handle any number of, to so take a mean, it just, it's just doing that. Um, so yeah, well done to Marta, who, who had a solution. And um, Jamie, are you asking for the code for the mean or the code for the percentage?
I mean. So uh, this one. Um, there we go. So um, you can use functions to manipulate your data, manipulate numbers, but you can also use functions to create plots. So we're going to go back to our SPC chart. So say you had this perfect setup for your SPC chart and you had it done for one organization and it was exactly what you needed and you wanted the exact same plot, but just for a different organization or a different time period maybe. Um, you can create a function that has everything the same except the bit that varies. In this case, we're varying by site or organization code. So this function, um, we've called it plot site, or it only takes an organization code. It only takes the RVR or the RTH or whatever site it is you're interested in. So it starts off by taking your data and it filters it just for that organization. It then creates a plot in the SBC plot. This is the same code as earlier. So we're looking at attendances over the period. We're looking at um, improvement is a decrease and we're faceting it by field. And then it returns that plot with those um, nice tweaks those amendments to the uh, presentation of the graph. So we, we're saying two months in our axis break and we don't want fixed axis. So if we run this function and we're applying it just to this organization and might take a moment, there we go. So this is for our J1. We've got attendance, we've got period, we've got a different facet for our types and we can see what's happening our SPCs for these ones. But because we've now written that code in a function, we can just use, we can do it for another organization without having to write all that code over again. It's just there, we've got it. This organization only has type one attendances, so, but if it had more, there would be other ones there. Um, yes, Andy is right. And that's what we're just kind of come on to that this function only works if data is in your global environment. Um, and it's good practice for your function not to call in anything outside of that function. So what's happening here is that within our function, we've used this data, but we haven't told it what data is. It's just relying on the fact that we have something in our global environment called data. This is not best practice. You want to make sure your functions are like contained. Um, it can cause issues. So if later on you change something um, in your data, for example. Um, so it's best practice to tell the function what it's using. So rather than just assuming that you've got something called data, to actually give it that data. Um, you can set it by default. So in some functions, um, you can have these default arguments that make things a bit easier so you don't have to specify it. Um, but generally, when you're creating these functions, you should make sure that everything is in there. So here we've got, as default, we're saying our default organization is RJ1, and our default data to use is data. Um, and then the rest is the same. So here we've got DF, because that's what we've named it, rather than data. But the rest of it is the same code. So if we run this, and then we can run that plot site and it will still run. Um, there we go. Because we've set RJ1 as a default, we could actually also remove this and just run plot site and it's still gonna work because we've got that default organization. But if we want to specify a different site, we could, uh, what was the other one? RDD. We could give it that argument there. So just before I move on, are there questions about this so far? So that's a good question. Is it best practice to keep all your functions in a separate R script? And if so, should you have one per project? 
Um, so when I first started using R, I was told to keep my functions in one place at the very top of the script. Um, but this was like 10 years ago. And um, what I would do now is I would recommend that you keep your functions in a separate R script and to source them into your file. And the reason for that is so that you can then, you then don't have to copy and paste your functions between your scripts. You can just keep referring back to that original, um, that you've only got it in one place and you can just refer to that file. If you're finding that you're using the same functions in the same file in all of your projects, you might want to consider making a package. Making an R package sounds complicated and it can be a bit confusing, but it's also, it's, it's the kind of thing that you could do in bits and pieces. You can just put one function in there and then work out how to do everything else later on. But it means that you can call it across all your different projects without having to source an R file or without having to write the function in your code each time in each script. Um, and there's lots of good resources on creating packages out there. And I'm sure if you had any questions about it, people in the NHSR community would love to help you with that. Um, yeah, so I, I would recommend if you're using the same function across lots of different projects, then that's something you could look into. Or if you just want to keep it in a separate R script and just keep copying and pasting that file into each of your projects, that's also fine. It's just what works for you and where you're at in your um, journey with this and whether your functions are really flexible or not, or if they're very specific. Are there any other questions so far? Okay. Um, so what have we got here? So we've done this function to create a facet plot for any single site. Um, but we now want to create the same plot over a number of sites. So say I wanted to do this for RDD and what was the other one, RJ1, and uh, I'm gonna make up some codes now, RWX, maybe that's one. Um, yeah, so you could call the function each time. So you could say plot site for RDD, you could then do plot site for site equals RJ1 and so on. You can, um, yeah, so you, you could just keep calling the function for each one, or you can create a list, create a list. Uh, uh, yeah, so you, you might have a list to apply it to, um, but then you need to, you've, you've got a list of 10 organizations at this time, but in next month, it might be nine organizations. So then you have to keep sort of updating your code and remember which, which organizations am I doing this month kind of thing. Um, which sort of leads us on to this next thing, which is called a for loop. So this is the idea that you can supply um, like a, a list or a vector of things to sort of iterate over. So it's just, I've given you this list of organization codes, go and run this plot for every single one of them. So, um, yeah, a loop is something, it repeats a portion of code for a desired number of times um, and you're iterating. Um, so if we just start off with like generating some sequences and we're gonna build up to what a loop actually does and looks like. So this function, seq, seek, uh, or sec, I don't, yeah, I'm gonna say seek because it's sequence, but yeah. Um, so we've got one to the number 10, so we've got, it's printed out one, two, up to 10. We could change that to one to 100 or whatever we'd like. We could start at three if we wanted to. Um, uh, so say you want to, uh, you want to print out the sequence number plus that number by like that number and the number plus five. So you can make a loop to do that. So you're saying um, for i in sequence one to 10, which will be one, two, three, four, and so on, um, add the five and print out i plus five equals whatever i plus five is. 
So when you're iterating, when you're doing loops, it's um, sort of typical in programming to start off with an I and then a J and then a K um, if you're nesting loops. But you can you could put anything in there. You could put a full word. You can say um, for number, for example, whatever works for you. Um, it's just I as a standard and you will sort of see that all over the place. So the way this code works is it says for I in sequence one to 10, add five to that number and then paste or well, print this result. And um, so it takes I as the first thing in this vector. So I in the first thing that vector is one. So it'll do one plus five and it will print out one plus five equals six. And then it's gonna loop back and start again. So then I will be the next thing in the vector, which is two. And it'll do two plus five, equals seven, and then it will be three and so on. And it keeps looping around, it keeps iterating until it reaches the end of that vector, which is 10. So if we run it, it's returned one plus five equals six, two plus five equals seven, right up to 10 plus five equals 15. So it just looped around, it just kept doing that, just changing I up that vector one at a time. Um, so looking back at the like the curly brackets and the scope so a for loop just like the if else statements um well the if statements has a global scope so what this means is that you will see things in your environment so um for example the i is there i is 10 here and the reason it's 10 is because that was the last one that it did in the loop you've also got i plus five there 15. um but if this was a function, that wouldn't be in your environment because the function has a narrower scope. Um, yeah, so when you're running these, if you've got like something that's quite slow or um, if it sort of stops halfway in your loop, you'll see that the I is just the last thing that was run where it got up to. Um, it just writes over it each time it runs through the loop. So going back to the seek function, you can, there are lots of different ways you can put in it. So you can give it different starts and stops. You can also give it different ways to count up in. So the default is to count up in one, which is why we did, when we did one, 10, it went one, two, three, four, up to 10. But here we can say, go from 50, go to the number of rows in my data set and count in 500s. So it's done 50, 550, right up to one, two, five, five, zero. If you're working with dates, there's also seek.date. Um, you have to give it dates. So for example, we could start with January. We can go to um, February and now, I'm just going to remind myself, I think this is one where you use things like day, month. Yeah. So if I say days, that'll print all the days between January and February. If I change this to, now change it to June and month, it'll print all the months between those. So seq if you just want numbers seq.date if you're looking for dates i'm going to pop this one in the chat just in case people want that for future um you can count things in years months quarters days and weeks so so far we've just looked at looping over numbers um but you can also loop over characters over strings and um, that's where it can get really quite interesting. So for example, we're just setting a vector. So we've got these three people, we've got Bob, Pete and Mary, and then we've got a loop and we want to say hello to each of these people. So if we run this, it'll say, hello, Bob, hello, Pete, hello, Mary. And we can add more names in there. And now we're saying, hello, Jeremy. Um, what you can do is you can, within a function, uh, so you can run a function within a loop. Um, so 
Just going back to something that I said earlier, a function can only return one thing. Um, and what you what we would really like to do is we would like to collate a bunch of things and return that instead. But because a function only returns one thing, you convert it into a list. So a list is a way of just putting lots of different types of objects into one thing. So you can have a vector in there, you can have a date frame, you can have a plot in there, you can have all of those things. Um, but it, it's only one thing in your global environment, which has like little components. It's, it's a list of things. So within a loop, you can create a list. So what we're gonna do is we had our SPC function to create a plot for just one site. And we're now gonna loop that function and create it for three different sites. So we start off by creating an empty list. This is something that you, if you put it in your loop, it's gonna get overwritten every time. So you need to put it outside of your loop so that we can add into it. It's um, you're creating the shelf so that you can put things on it. So we're then gonna create our vector, which is the three organization codes we're interested in. And then using our plot site function from before, we just loop over. So what this has done in the environment, we can see that we've got this plot list. And if I click on this, it's, it doesn't look like plots. It's just a, it's just a list. And that's because each of these is a plot, but it's in one object. And the way you can get those plots out of that list is by just calling it with the square brackets. So we just want the plot for RQM. We can say plot list RQM. Or if we want RJ1, we can say plot list RJ1. Now bring out that plot. You can also call them by the number. So if you did plot list one, it's going to return the first thing in that list, which happens to be the RQM plot. So let's say that you, this, we gave it the three organizations to look at, but let's say that next month there might be a different set of organizations. It might be four organizations. It might be three, but completely different organization codes. So you want to, run this loop but in a dynamic way and you're not entirely sure what's going to be input into this so what you can say so we're just going to create a vector of the unique organization codes in our data set so there are 274 organization codes in this and what you could do is you could in here in your um if you were to run this now it's gonna do an SPC chart for every single one of those organization codes. I'm not gonna run this right now because it's really long. It'll take quite a lot of time, but I suppose um, just to demonstrate, I could do one, two, four maybe, and let's see what that looks like. So we've got four vet, four organizations and I could run that, um, that loop. So it's looped over the four things. I can look at my list and see that it's got the, um, ah, see, I didn't reset my, but there we go. Uh, there we go, we've got four there. Um, but you, if you wanted to do it for all 274, you can run it, um, that's, that's up to you. Yeah, um, so that is the end of the course. We've covered a lot of different things. It's sort of like an overview of all the, the things that you might want to do. And it's um, sort of like a, a brief introduction to those things. There's lots that you could drill down into, um, which I do recommend you just go away and have a play with them and see, see what happens. But um, yeah, and if there are any questions, you feel free to ask them now in this chat while we're still here. I'm happy to hang around for a little bit and answer questions um, or reach out to people in the NHSR community or other people in other courses that you know. Thank you. Are there any questions?